Hello and welcome. This is Daryl Ehrlich and this is the Billings Gazette Stories of Honor 2019. Today I am in studio and joined by James Mariska and I am excited because I've known James for years and he's uh, he's a wonder he's got a wonderful story because uh, he not only was involved uh, as a as a soldier for uh, for a number of years and then also after that. So we're going to talk to him. James, thanks for Thanks for sitting in. Sure. Appreciate it. In fact, I had the honor of telling his his uh, uncle's story. His uncle uh, saw the D-Day invasion, and so that was, uh, that's was that been an honor for me, but now I get to tell his story, and I'm really excited to do that, so thank you. So, James, let's start at the beginning. I always start the same way. Uh, tell me about your your where you were born and raised and how you got into the military. Well, I uh, my father was the youngest of 10. My mother was the oldest of seven. And they met in a little small town of Waseca, Minnesota. My father was born in 1921, my mother in 22. And uh, my father graduated from high school in 1938, 39. And at that time, he was the first member of both families that went on to post-secondary education. He actually got his high school diploma, but he went to post-secondary education into what at that time was high-tech uh, radio. Mm -hmm. And he went to Kansas City, to the Kansas City Radio School. I think he was there a year, year and a half. And when he got out, he got a job with United Airlines. And the first place they put him was in San Francisco, California. Uh, my mother and father got married at that time, and they moved out there. And that's where my brother and I were born literally within a mile of the entrance of the San Francisco airport. Um, but having that long stretch of family, my, on my father's side, uh, several generations had been active in the military, and on my mother's side, it was the same thing. Um, I actually have a picture of myself with uh, my grandparents and my brother and I outside of Joe DiMaggio's restaurant where I'm about six years old, and the picture was taken by my uncle who was on his way to Korea. He was a Marine. And I remember our putting him on the boat, going to Korea, and then watching the, the news about the Korean War and then waiting for the boat to come back. Uh, we had overseas caps on that he brought us and uh, so that was kind of an introduction to the military. But my father flew in the Pacific. Um, my uncle was a, was a seaman on, in the Navy in the Pacific uh, part of World War II. And then I had also uh, my uncle, who was obviously in the, the European theater, but also my grandfather had been a uh, seaman on the battleship New York during World War I. Uh, one of my aunts was married to a gentleman who fought in the trenches in World War II one also. So, you know, there was just that, I grew up around all that. And then of course, after the war in the San Francisco Bay Area, there was 15, 20 military bases. And uh, it was just kind of part of our life, our upbringing. Mm -hmm. uh, when my brother graduated from high school, he was a little older than I was. He immediately entered the military. And uh, I thought I would take a little time off, came up to Montana. I lived with my uncle in Missoula and started uh, at the University of Montana. And I first put the uniform on in ROTC, which was mandatory at that time. It was in the fall of 1964 that uh, I would have entered college. And by 1965, it was obvious that I was going to get drafted. I, I had left my draft board in California. I remember my, my classification physical, which was October 15th, 1964, and it was the day that Khrushchev was deposed from the, the uh, Soviet Union government. And uh, it was, uh, for some reason, I remember that. It was a significant day. And I knew I was 1A and that it was going to happen. So a friend of mine and I both went down in October and volunteered for the military and come to find out it was the largest draft call of the Vietnam War at that time. Um, I believe October uh, 1965, they drafted 35,000 people for the Vietnam War. Things were starting to get pretty hot there. By the time we got processed through Butte and everything, it was December 
6th when we left Butte. They flew us down to San Francisco, back home, and then onto a bus when we arrived at Fort Ord, California, real early in the morning on December 7th, greeted by two Hawaiian drill sergeants. Wow. I don't know if that was fate or if it was purposely done. So uh, were you, so 1964, was it, was it always understood that you were going to go into the military, being Ev from, a, from a military family? Eventually, yes, one okay. way or another. Either I was going to go through college and get an ROTC commission, or I was going to join. Right. Why did you decide to join then draft? What, what's, what was the th what was your Because I could pick where I wanted to go. Actually, I volunteered. You could volunteer for the draft, which was two years, and they just threw you in the pool for whoever they, they needed you for. Or you could volunteer uh, as a regular uh, volunteer, and that would be a three-year commitment. Or you could pick a specialty, and that would be a four-year commitment. So I picked the specialty. I, I uh, asked for the Army Security Agency, which they would guarantee you if you volunteered for four years. And it was specialized education. Of course, they had to do a top-secret background investigation for me. and. So once I finished basic training down at Fort Ord, they sent me to Fort Gordon, Georgia for training in, at that time, some fairly advanced te technology, which was uh, cryptography. Hmm. So uh, I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, the Southeastern Signal School, to learn about cryptography. Hmm. And uh, from there, I ended up volunteering for the... Uh, Infantry Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, and once I graduated from the school at uh, Fort Gordon, I was sent to Fort Benning, and I got commissioned as a second lieutenant in February of 1967 before I turned the age 21. Wow. Did you, obviously, uh, you're seeing Vietnam heat up. Is Very that, much so. Is that, when you're, nine, you're 20 at the time? 20. 20. Does that worry a twenty-year-old? Oh yeah, yeah. My my ROTC instructor at Fort or at uh, University of Montana had just come back from Vietnam, and he had talked to us about that. Uh, almost all of our drill instructors, from basic training to AIT to advanced training to OCS, almost all of them at one time or another had been to Vietnam or had been in Korea. Our, our uh, platoon sergeant at basic training um, had been in both World War II and Korea, and his sole goal was to make sure that all of us in that platoon survived on the battlefield, and I'll never forget him. His name was Sergeant Shaw. He was- uh, that, that sounds like a good sergeant, yeah. He was the first black man that I had ever been around. Yeah. Um, and and uh, he had virtually an all-white platoon, and he, he was, I had a tremendous amount of respect for Sergeant Shaw. All of us did. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. What did he say about surviving in, in places like Korea or Vietnam? Well, when we were out in the field doing whatever it was that he was training us on, he would bring that up. He says, this may someday save your life. You need to learn what this is about and what we're doing, why we're doing it. Yeah. And uh, he, he was good at explaining it. Sometimes he didn't. He just let you experience it. <laughs> Appreciate those in moments too? Yes, you do. They, yeah. Those are ones you never forget. Right. Did you, uh, um, uh, so you went and you decided that rather than uh, kind of just go into a pool at two years, you were going to spend four years. Did you intend to make the military a career? Yes. Okay. Why? It uh, it provided a lot of opportunities, particularly for education. Our our family always considered education a key to to having a, a better life. Maybe not a successful life or a happy life, but it was certainly. Uh, something that my mother and father both made sure that we understood that uh, education was a very important thing as we were growing up and so it was drilled into us right and there are tremendous educational opportunities in the military i don't think there was hardly a year i spent 34 years in the military both active and reserves 
that I was not in some type of schooling or education program or hmm. some something where I was learning something new almost every single year. Yeah. Did you, it, it seems interesting that you, ch you volunteered for the four years, you wanted to do this career, and you go into Army intelligence, Ar uh, Army security. Did you know going in that's what you wanted to do, or how did you determine that path as the one that you wanted? Well, it was one that I, I think had right at that time was when all of the 007 movies came out. Okay, okay, okay all right. There was a certain <laughs> amount of excitement to that. Did now, I, there was no chance of me ever becoming a agent, but right. there was a chance of being involved in that type of business, and it excited us. Yeah, okay, so uh, did the, when, now obviously 007 <laughs> versus what you were being trained for, yeah. probably there's a gap between what you saw on the silver screen and what, what was There was a huge there. step, yes. Yeah. <laughs> did you, uh, what was, uh, did you find it to your liking though? Was it a disappointment or was it? Oh no, it, it was probably the best thing I ever did. I mean, talk about opening doors to adventure if nothing else mm -hmm. uh once i got commissioned uh they said well we can't keep you in the army security agency I said, why because you don't have a college degree as an officer you needed to have a college degree to be in the army security agency you could be enlisted man without a degree and that was fine so i said oh crud Wish you so, would have told me that, right? Well, they why would they? They had you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but they said, but uh, we will transfer you to the military intelligence branch. However, you you are gonna have to get your, your college education, either part-time or something, in order for us to keep you. So it was pretty clear at the age of 20 where I had to go. So um, I went to Fort Holabird, Maryland, to the intelligence school, and I did become an agent. I became a, a, uh, a counterintelligence uh, specialist, and uh, uh, I was then transferred to the 66, 6, 67th MI detachment in Fort Richardson, Alaska. I had orders originally to go to Trang, Vietnam, but my brother was in Fubai, and there was only my brother and I, and he was in the Army Security Agency, and they wouldn't send the two of us in the same spot. So they yeah. sent me to Alaska while he finished out his tour in Vietnam. Um, I ended up uh, being in the counterintelligence section of the, uh, uh, the military detachment there, and then for one reason or another, fate, I got transferred to the general staff and I worked on the G2 section. Again, I was their counterintelligence and then their cryptographic uh, officer. And as such, I got to travel all over the command, uh, either with the general staff or with the general or on my own. And so I went all the way out to Shimya to the intelligence base out there. And I went all the way up to the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory at Port Barrow. And then I hopped on a C-130 and they flew me out to Ice Island T3, which was 950 miles north of that. We were 300 miles from the North Pole, landed on an iceberg, and stayed there for 10 days as we floated around the Arctic Ocean, listening to our neighbors up there. <laughs> so that's what you had to do to listen to your neighbors? Well, you know who our neighbors were. Yeah, there. no, I do. Yeah, no, no, okay. Listen. Yeah, no, I get... That, well, that was fun. Well, <laughs> cold, cold, colder yeah, than heck. Yeah, no, I... Uh, so you can beat anybody's Montana cold stories. So. Oh, yes. Yes. There's nothing like being on top of the world in February. <laughs> what did you, uh, did you finish up your degree? How did that work? Did well, I started taking classes at the University of Alaska at night. Wow. That's so. dedication. <laughs> That's dedication. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you where it finally dawned on me that I had to get, I had to get done is, is that I had two... Uh, by now, I was a first lieutenant, and uh, the fellow who was the in charge of our section was a major, and he got transferred. And here I am. I'm a I'm a first lieutenant filling a major slot on a general staff, and they gave me these two old crusty E8 master sergeants. Um, they were really great guys. They had been in the military their entire lives, and they were. 
uh, really helpful in teaching me things that I needed to know, which I didn't know much, so they were teaching me all the time. But uh, I also became a member of the Reserve Officer Association, ROA, and we had a meeting in Anchorage, and then a whole bunch of people came this one time. My two master sergeants came to that, and they were in their officer uniforms, and they were both majors. And I said, wait a minute, you guys never told me you were enlisted. You, you know, you're enlisted men. They said, no, we were officers during World War II, and after the war, we got ripped reduction in force yeah. and they said you can either stay in and complete your career but you're going to be an enlisted man or you can get out hmm. and I thought hmm and by 1969 President uh, Nixon had been elected and he started making reductions in force in Vietnam as a matter of fact I had orders to go to Long Bin and uh, they were canceled because the unit that I was going to had already been shut down and brought back to the United States. So it was very, very obvious to me that things were starting to wind down and that I had to get out and, and, and get my education done if I wanted to have any type of career in the military. Hmm. Did you, uh, were you worried about going to Vietnam? Oh yeah, the first time that I got, I saw my name on the list to go to the train, I about died. You know? <laughs> I mean, everybody was going. I mean, you know, you either either you were going to Vietnam or you were going to Europe. And of course, at that time, the the Cold War was really cold. Yeah. I think I mean it was heating up and it was bad. It was it wasn't really good. We were really tied between a rock and hard place, and uh, you know we had five hundred thousand troops over in in Europe. Um, and then, of course, you know, we had over 500,000 troops in Vietnam, and things were tight. As a matter of fact, uh, we had just finished a winter exercise in Alaska in uh, February of 1968 when it grabbed the Pueblo. And I actually was on, on duty that night that they grabbed it, and I had to call the general up of the command and say, look, there's a situation going on that you need to come in here real quick. I said, it better be good. I said, it's really good. Right. That's the way you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were, we were the only winner-oriented um, and prepared troops at the time that could be deployed anywhere. At the, uh, you know, we were uh, about a brigade up there, and Korea was very close. And so they started making movements to get ready to, to go to Korea in case things got bad. And, there were a lot of people nervous about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it. Uh, all my friends from from, you know, I went to infantry OCS. Mm -hmm. There was only three of us out of the entire company that got branch transfers out of the infantry. Two of us went to MI, and one went to I think engineers or something like that. Hmm. So, so the rest were in Vietnam. So the rest of them, you had six months in, in the United States to train with a unit. Uh, we graduated in February, so uh, by August, September, they were getting their orders to go to Vietnam, and they would go to Vietnam for 12 to 13 months. They would spend the first six months out in the field, and then they would come back in, and usually they'd, they'd be closer to their base camps, and then they'd come home. Well, six months after that was Tet. So almost everybody that I was in in uh, OCS with experienced Tet and Tet out in the field. Mm -hmm. That's got to be nerve-wracking thinking, when's my time? Yeah. 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 Did you, uh, uh, what was the, as you're, you're in military intelligence, you're in, um, y you're, you're, it's 1968, you're a young man. What did you think of the war going on at the time? We were, there were no weekends. There were no, there, you know, especially in Alaska, night is day and day is night, right. depending on what time of year it is. So, you know, it was just, it was just a continuous time that we were involved in all kinds of things going on. Um, and communications back then, you know, if you had a TV anywhere, which we had at the officers club, that's the only place that you had a television, almost all the programs and the news and everything else were put on an airplane in Seattle, flown up and played four hours later. So you weren't really in touch with 
current events in the United States other than I did, we had teletypes and stuff that I would pull news off and we'd give it to the general during the briefings. And I subscribed to a couple of magazines that would come a week or two late and well read. Um, but, uh, and I knew that the, the anti-war stuff started picking up and things were going on in Vietnam that weren't going well. And, uh, you know, you would, you, we would get people transferred into our staff who had been there and some had had good time and some had bad times. And I knew a lot of guys who had bad times. Yeah. Um, uh, it really didn't hit you until you came back to the continental United States. Mm -hmm. And then you realized that things weren't as good as you thought they were. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, so what does military intelligence look like in the age of Vietnam? Because even Vietnam, though it's a hot war, there are Cold War forces behind it. We're trying to contain oh, yeah. communism. We're 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 worried about the Chinese and the Russians being behind the North, and we're we're, we're very concerned with with that. So, I what what does intelligence look like at that time? What are what are you doing? What are you trying to understand? Well, again, being a we were we were kind of a strategic reserve for the active component when we were up in Alaska, because that's obviously the top of the world. And if, if our, our neighbors mm -hmm. were to, to venture towards our area, they would come that direction. That was the, that was the assumption. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would have been an easy way for them to come over and visit us. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting being there because we were right next to Elmendorf Air Force Base. And Elmendorf Air Force Base was a refueling stop for all of the men and supplies going to Vietnam and the men in the boxes coming back from Vietnam. And more than once, I would go over and visit people that were, you know, they'd stop and have a couple hours on the ground and, you know, you'd help serve them coffee and talk to them and things. So you have this war that's going on in Southeast Asia and these people coming through, you could hear the planes every night or during the day, they were just constant. I mean, you know, about every 10, every 15 minutes and things got really hot, they were moving a lot of people through that area. So you knew things were really going on. Yet at the very next time, you know, I'm up on an ice cap listening in on what's going on next door. Mm -hmm. And then you hear about what what was happening over in Europe and the things that were were heating up over there, and it was there was a lot of tension. People were really concerned. We were spread thin. Um, you know, the politics of things had had changed an awful lot. It was, I think, there was some relief when Nixon went to China. Mm -hmm. You know, and kind of opened that door a little bit. It kind of you could kind of feel a little air go out of the balloon. Um, there was some relief when when uh, uh, there was some some progress made working with the the Soviets, but that that really didn't cool off until the seventies. Yeah, that we didn't see. But you know, so you go in right as in 1965 as we're really committing combat troops, and you you're kind of in the thick of things during Tet. How does the rest of your career during, because Vietnam ends in 1974, what else are you doing and what else, uh, does your perspective as a soldier or on the war change during that time? Does it evolve? I mean, you're getting older. This is a long war, 65 to 74, yeah. seems long. What, how's that, how, how does the evolution of that play out in your life and in your mind? Well, I, I finally got off active duty I got off just in time to start class at the University of Montana in September of 1969. The very first day I walked on campus, there was almost a campus-wide anti-war protest rally in the Oval. Hmm. How did that feel? Confusing. Why? I couldn't understand why they were against us, you know, us being those of us who were really serving. I, I, you know, at the time, things were pretty macro for me, you yeah, know. Right. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, the, I 
think I, I don't know the exact dates, but I, I think some of the the stuff for the Chicago Democratic Convention had been going on, and the riots there. There had been a lot of riots, and there were a lot of anti-war activity and stuff. And I'm sitting there going, "Wait a minute, you know, I'm, you know, I've, I've been with guys the entire time that are doing their best to protect the liberties you have, so you can do this, and you're yelling and screaming at us." And yeah. I. That was bad enough. I, I stood off to the side and I, I just, you know, I just shook my head. But probably the worst thing that ever happened to me, and it probably goes and coincides with some of the stories you've heard from people who came back from Vietnam and, and elsewhere, is that a week or two later I was in the Copper Commons having something to eat. I stayed in the dorms and was trying to get my degree and get back on duty. And, uh, one of my friends introduced me to a friend of his who was a hippie looking character and would, was telling him that I had just got off active duty and I was here to finish my degree and that I had been an officer in the Army. And this guy just unloaded on me right smack oh. dab in the middle of the Copper Commons. I mean, literally got this close yelling and screaming at me about being an officer and being in the Army. and. It was everything I could do to control myself. Mm. And I just, I walked out of there just shaking my head. I said, where are these people coming from? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, he, he could have stabbed me in the stomach with a knife and probably not hurt me as much as he did just yelling at me in front of everybody. Yeah. What, uh, did you, um, I'm sure when, you, when that happened, um, you had to feel like uh, there are people who did understand what was really going on, or yeah. how to, yeah, is that, is that, yeah. What did you understand the, uh, when you look back at it, at the time, did you understand any of their criticisms, or was criticism of the war justified in your opinion? When you're in the military, you know, all, all war is is politics by another mean. Huh. When you're in the military, what you're thinking about is the job that you've been trained to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're put in situations where the people on the other side of you don't like you. They want to kill you. And, you know, it's a, it's a fight for survival. I did not ever see combat in all the time that I was in the military. And, I mean, I volunteered for everything. You know, I volunteered for special forces, I volunteered for all kinds of things, and I think they thought I was nuts, so they wouldn't send me. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, I always wrote the blank check to the military, saying, I'm ready, willing, and able to do whatever it is that you want me to do to defend who we are. And that's what this is all about, mm -hmm. is, is this is what we will defend. And this is the the, the Constitution of the United States and our freedoms and the and the society and, and the government and things that we have, and we say defend. We don't work. This is defense, not offense. You know, we don't call it a war department anymore. We call it the defense department. Yeah. And it's the, the freedoms that we have in our way of life that we are defending. And I think a lot of people have a hard time separating the two. Mm -hmm. um, Politics is politics, and, it, and and I've seen it change a lot. I've seen it, you know, go from one side to the other, and, you know, there's still the commander-in-chief. I don't care who he is or wh who she is. It doesn't matter. Uh, we're here to defend. Yep. What happened after Missoula, then what'd you do? Uh, by then, the war had wound down, and then they did not need us quite so much, but mm -hmm. they did need a reserve force, so... Um, I, I went into the individual ready reserve while I was in college, and as soon as I graduated, I ended up uh, going on the active reserve units, and I stayed in the reserves for the rest of the time that I was in the military. Why did you decide to stay on the active reserves? You've done your time, you got your degree. Again, it was, it was just a sense of serving. Um, it was, there was some adventure in that. Uh, there was, again, a way to learn and train and meet people, uh, to travel, and I did a lot of that. Okay. Um, I had a lot of opportunity. You know, I'd, I'd 
I had a lot of background. I had a lot of things that I thought maybe I could give back to the country. Mm -hmm. So, what was the, do you have a favorite point in your career during all of that? As time went along, um, I was transferred out of military intelligence and went into ordnance, which is one of the uh, support functions. And uh, <laughs> before I know it, I, I ended up becoming a battalion commander. Um, and uh, I ended up uh, chairing what was called the Reserve Components Advisory Board to the Ordnance Corps, which was down at uh, Redstone Arsenal. Well, Redstone Arsenal is right next to the Marshall Space Flight Center. And there's all kinds of neat stuff going on. And, you know, it's the techni technical uh, area of the South, kind of like Silicon Valley is to California. Uh, um, if you go down to Huntsville, Alabama, it's very high tech and very, very interesting. Um, that was fascinating to me. You know, they were developing the Patriot missile system at the time. Mm -hmm. It was one thing that kind of got the, the our opponents a little anxious is that we had the ability to shoot down what it is that they'd throw at us. So, um, but you know, um, Nazi Germany's uh, uh, scientists all lived there. You know, they were able to go over to Germany at the end of the war, and they brought back all of their their propulsion scientists and, and, and stuff. So they were all there. Werner von Braun, they had a big auditorium there named after him. And it was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. You know, we, I went back there two, three times a year. Uh, then the next thing I know, I, I got another promotion and I was uh, uh, in charge of a, a training uh, outfit with about the size of a regiment, which covered several states. And so I got to travel around and meet and work with them. And uh, then the next thing I know, I actually became a, a group commander, which is the equivalent to about a brigade. And I was in charge of all of the reserve units in Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, northern half of Utah, and northern half of Colorado. And we were bigger than the Montana National Guard. As a, I was a full bird at the time. And, you know, the National Guard in those states had two-star generals, you know, and I'm doing it on a part-time basis. And so we traveled around a lot. Uh, we got to do a lot of different things. Uh, I went to Europe four times. Uh, uh, we uh, were involved in some fairly interesting training exercises. We were very, very close to current world situations. We saw the, the Guard and the Reserve evolve from being weekend warriors to actually being a critical part of the national defense that if and when um, a, a conflict came up that you would be activated and, and sent and that in fact happened both in the Gulf War and then the, the invasion of Iraq and the invasion of Afghanistan um, uh, in Kosovo and uh, uh, Somalia uh, going down to Nicaragua all of those things, they could not pull that off without having Guard and Reserve troops supporting them. And as a matter of fact, I think I just read the other day that there's some Reserve troops being activated right now going over to Europe. So it no longer is what a lot of people thought during the Vietnam War and that little peace period afterwards that the Guard and Reserve didn't have much to do. They really are an integral part of the national defense right now that they never had before. Did you, how does it change moving from a soldier, an individual person who, you know, you may have been, you were commissioned as an officer, so you had, you had troops, but now the, as you ascended the ranks, you have more and more, how does that change your mentality from kind of being an individual soldier to a leader of large groups of soldiers? Yeah. It's like if you have a dog, you can have a dog, you can tell them to sit, stand, you know, stay, whatever. When you have a battalion or a brigade, you guide them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I say you're, you're, you're in lead of a buffalo herd that's charging across the prairie, and you either, they're either going to go across the, the, the river at a nice spot or they're going to go over a cliff and kill themselves and so you have to really manage them more than you're never going to turn a herd sometimes mm -hmm. but you can manage the herd yeah 
So the, you know, you get your, you know, you have your mission, you have the things that you're supposed to do, and you you can't do it without your support staff, and you certainly can't do it without home support. Mm -hmm. If it isn't for the families, the spouses, the friends, the neighbors, the employers mm -hmm. out there, you're you're really in trouble. What? And and the state of Montana and uh, the communities in Montana have been very, very, very supportive. Yeah. What did you um, What did you love most of all about doing it? You had to love You had to love something to keep doing it for that long. <laughs> well, you again. I, I I met a lot of people, lifelong friends. Probably my closest friends are people that I have met who've been in the military. Um, I've been places and done things that have been very interesting, mm -hmm. very fascinating. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about some of the things you might ask me is, is I was down at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is the head, uh, head school and training area for military intelligence. And we were talking about uh, being caught behind enemy lines. And uh, one of my friends who, uh, and this is an interesting story. When my wife and I got married, I'll, I'll get back to that in just a second. My wife and I got married in, in at Soldier's Chapel uh, outside of Big Sky. My wife had been in the military also. She was a cook in the military for three years, stationed over in Germany during the Cold War. But we got together as an introduction of some military friends. So here's you know the connection. So we got married at Soldier's Chapel. Three of my friends who were some of uh, in the, the groomsmen's party or whatever, one came from New York City. He was in the, the military with me in the reserves, and he was a, a police officer in the department back there. Another guy came from Deland, Florida. Uh, same thing, same background. And another one came from Silicon Valley in California. So to have people coming from all over to our wedding that we got married on September 11th hmm. at Big Sky in 1982 and we went for our honeymoon to New York City and we have pictures of ourselves on top of the Twin Towers. Hmm. So anyway. Did you, uh, what's the most, uh, uh, is there, a, in, granted that you were in military intelligence, so what's the most fascinating thing you think the Army gave you the opportunity to do? To understand how things work, that you can't do it by yourself. You have to. It has to be a team effort. Uh, I sit on the Academy Selection Board for Senator Daines and for Congressman Gianforte, and we've. I, I've been on it for 15, 20 years through a series of different representatives that we've had, and we interview all of the kids from Montana who are applying for West Point, uh, Annapolis Air Force, and Merchant Marine Academy. And the one thing that we always ask them is, do, are they involved in team sports? And if you go to any of the academies, when you drive up to them, virtually the very first thing you see are the playing fields and gymnasiums and the things. And, and, the, and the whole point is, is can you work as a team for a common goal and succeed? And you can't do that in the military without having teamwork, and you can't do that out in the private sector or through life without teaming up with people and getting things done. Was your father worried that he sent two, his two, only two sons off to ostensibly the army or war? No, never. Okay. I, well, I think partly for the fact that he and all of his brothers and our fathers and grandfathers had all been, I mean, this was just kind of part of it. Right, right. Did you, um, uh, well, first of all, did your wife, uh, your wife goes into the military as a cook. That's, uh, did she come from a military background too? No. Huh. No, this was something pretty new to her. <laughs> <laughs> However, she, uh, she always loved to cook. And uh, she was, she went through cooking school with uh, with the military, but she got signed to an officer's club in Germany, and there she worked under a uh, cordon bleu chef. Hmm. 
who was a civilian, he was a private contractor, and he it was basically like going to a continental cooking school for her for the next year and a half while she was stationed in you Germany. You married very well then. Yes, I did. <laughs> and when she came back, she came back and finished her degree also, and she did it on the GI Bill. Hmm. And she got her master, she got her bachelor's and her master's here. Did, when you're in uh, the joke, and I've heard it, I'm sure you have too, military intelligence. Har, har, har. Har, har, har. What is military intelligence? What, what's its help us understand what its function is and and what is it what does it do um, and why why did why did you seem well suited for it? well basically what they're trying to do is, is you don't want any surprises so you want to know what the other guy is doing and just knowing about who the other guy is and how they think and what they have helps you prepare it's, it's no different than a coach at a, going to a major football game against one of their opponents. He wants to know, you know, who does he have? What are their capabilities? Who's healthy? Who isn't? What's, what, what do they normally do? And how can we defeat them? Mm -hmm. um, that's basically what we do. We try to find out what they're doing and uh, understand, you know, what's, what's happening, either very, very close on the battlefield as to, you know what's the what's the makeup of the opposing force so to be prepared is to be forearmed yeah yeah so you you do this career you go you go to a lot of places you learn a lot of things and then you leave you get out you retire but one of the things that i admire so much about you james is that you are still so active why 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 still stay active with veterans and issues and i don't uh, one of the things I've learned, particularly, we went back to West Point and had a tour of West Point. Got back there, and and uh, it was it was really fascinating. Um, met Pete Dawkins, the last Heisman Trophy winner for the Army. Actually, went to a football game with him. Sat up in the Commandant's box, and uh, but as we, I have a picture of myself with all of the cadets from Montana in a room that. Uh, General Bramlett and I, he's our board chairman, we went back and talked to him. And the one thing all of them said is, is that, you know, we learn here that you give back when you, when you're done with your tour of duty, you give back to everything that people have given us. You know, an, an education at one of the academies worth three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. um, dollars Granted, we need well-educated people in our military, but afterwards, um, they all give back. The, the people that I work with, are 95% of them are all veterans of some kind or another, and they're all worked involved in the community doing things. And it's almost like a fraternity or a sorority that you're with people that you know, you trust, you've been through tough times, you know how to work as a team, you know that it's important to get things done, you know that there are other people out there that need your help, um, and it's rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, uh, what are the greatest issues? Because you work with veterans every day. What are the greatest issues facing veterans today? Employment issues. In what way? Tell me about that. Uh, well, if, if they're still participating in the Guard or the Reserves, um, they can get called up at any time. Uh, there's an awful lot of demand on them for their time. Um, if they do get deployed, whether it's for th one week or two weeks for uh, an annual training or they're, they're sent overseas or they're, they're activated to, to give support for um, uh, a particular project or a, 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 a uh, excursion somewhere, um, you know, they're fulfilling an obligation and a need and they're actually, they're, they're learning things that they can bring back to their employers. But a lot of times, especially in Montana, you don't have major corporations here that can absorb that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a, you know, I, I've been in Montana long enough to know there's only 
two or three or four major corporations that are headquartered here. The rest of them are small companies that are anywhere from five to 50 people. And one or two people out of that for an extended period of time hurts. Yeah. It really does. You've got to cover for them. And so that's, that's tough for some of them. You, you have to manage that time and that flexibility. Um, the other things is, is, is of course, um, coming back, some of them have been exposed to things that are traumatic. Yeah. Whether they've been injured directly or indirectly, or they've seen things that don't set well. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult for anybody to be prepared for those eventualities. Yeah. Um, and it depends on your physical physiology, your family upbringing, uh, your, your moral and ethical standards. Uh, one of the things that you have are, and it's really tough on PTSD and on, on uh, uh, people who have traumatic brain injury, et cetera, the moral effects of war. Mm -hmm. that, you know, you've had to do things that maybe, you know, are not acceptable in civilian life. Yeah. But you have to in order to survive and or to accomplish your mission. Yeah, those are, those are things you repress probably to, to avoid the, the stress and the, the, the pain and the trauma of it. Some people deal with it with alcohol and or drugs. Some of them just work their butts off. <clears throat> One of the problems that they've had is, is that, you know, people in like World War II never talked about it, never talked about it until the day they died, like my uncle. Uh, the others who they finally, you know, towards the very end of their life will start saying, well, I saw this or I did that. Um, so there's just different ways that some of them deal with it. And um, those, are, those are struggles. Mm -hmm. and, but not everybody, and this is a problem, is we need to talk about it, but we also have to remember that not everybody suffers from these issues. Mm -hmm. You can't paint a broad brush that, geez, I'm not going to deal with or hire or go out and have a drink with a guy. You may go off the right. off his rocker on us. It's not. You know, it's it's I, a different makeup, isn't it? It really, and truly, it it really and truly is. And you know, I have a very close friend of mine right now that's dealing with some of those issues. Right. But uh, I have others who, you know, never bothered them. Hmm. It's not that they're callous or cold-hearted, but I think somewhere along the line you, you do deal with it. If, and I do a lot of reading, and I've, and I've read an awful lot of, of, of the situations that they've been in, and you know, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. What a, how is, has just being in the military changed? Because I think about when you go in, I think there was uh, Southeast Asia, Korea was done, but there was still the threat of communism and all that. And then we moved through kind of a Cold War, War period in the 80s. Then we moved to the 90s. We have the Gulf War. And then we have all of a sudden this, uh, the 9-11. The and it seems like there's been a global politics has changed an awful lot since you went in for your physical in October uh 15 1964 yeah. Four, yes. uh, <laughs> so how did how do you how does your thinking and how do you as a soldier evolve with that too because the wars we are fighting today are different and we understand even our enemy and how the world works in very different terms we do but almost the more they change the more they remain the same in what way tell me about that uh there was a time where we had detente where uh, you can see where our military said, eh, you know, we don't need to have 350,000 people on the, on the border along the Iron Curtain, and we don't have to worry about the Soviets and big massive land war in Europe, so we're going to prepare and work for contingency operations where we're going to have you know, our banana wars, you know, we've been to Panama, we've been to Nicaragua, we've been to, to yeah, El Salvador and, and Guad uh, um, Granada. Right. Uh, you know, we've had these little bush wars that we go in and take care. Even Somalia was somewhat, although that was a tip of an iceberg that we didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, but uh, Kosovo, uh, those types of things pop up, these skirmishes that it isn't an all-out war, it isn't a full mobilization, you, but, you, you know, I don't care if you get shot at and killed in a bush war or a major war, you're still dead. Yeah. And you've gone through the same fear and the same mm -hmm. processes and stuff. Uh, I think what happens now is, is, is there's, we have, we have broken off to where we have a major conflict where China and Russia are still, uh, uh very strong contenders for what we are doing in the world. And then we have the, the, on the other side, we have the, the little Syrias and the, the little uh, uh, guys down in, in, in North Africa who are willing to rattle our chain with minor uh, in, incursions and things, and yet, you know, Americans die. Yeah. And it, it, the more technology that we have, the more technology that they have to counter our technology, and it right. it gets back to it's that a technology back, war. Yeah, it does, yeah. and it gets back, and, and there's millions of people out there willing to sell the technology to the highest bidder, and there's a lot of money out there. Whether you're selling them oil or you're selling them, you know, silk or gold or yeah. whatever it is, it, it happens, and. Uh, um, and I, I, I don't know if there's ever been a time in our world that there hasn't been a conflict somewhere along the line. And again, you know, war is only politics with a different means. Did you, uh, looking back on it, would you do the same thing that you did if you were to go back to October 1964? Would you do the same? Would you yeah, go I, the same I, route? Yeah, I would be a little more diligent in my studies at college. <laughs> okay. But I, I'll tell you one thing, I learned a tremendous amount being an enlisted man going through what, what would eventually be my subordinates had gone through. Mm -hmm. And I knew what it was like to be an enlisted person. And I always kept that in the back of my mind whenever we were doing anything, because, you know, hey guys, I was one of you right. at one time. I mean, I've, I've seen the other side of the coin, too, that there's... When you're when you're an officer, particularly you're in charge of a platoon or a company or a battalion or brigade or whatever division, you see a lot of things that sometimes your subordinates don't know, but the subordinates need to keep you informed as to what's going on so that you can make a knowledgeable and and, and good decision. Yeah. Did you um, when you were in? In the service, did you uh, imagine that you were going to spend 34 years? No, then... no. 20 was it, and then I was going to retire and enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps What keeps you coming back still? I mean, you have the excuse you, you've retired, you, you've done enough. Why? Why do you keep doing it? I mean, I see you at VFW functions. I see you at uh, your 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 helping veterans. You're advocating. You're going to. You're advocating for things like better PTSD treatment. Why? Why? Because uh, they deserve it. You know, they're just. We have a great country. We have an outstanding country. This is probably the best country in the world, and people are doing a lot of things to get here. Yeah. Um, and I would like to see that way of life preserved. Yeah. And there are people who are willing to step forward and say, we will protect that. Mm -hmm. We will defend it. And I think they deserve our support. If you could tell people one thing about your military career, one, one lesson that you learned from it, what, what would that be? What is the one, uh, one great lesson that, it, that it's taught you? I guess never be afraid to step forward and and defend what you think is right. Yeah. Because if you don't, who will? Right. Does it, uh, sometimes we don't think of the military as the play, we think of it as groupthink, but, but you're actually saying it taught you to step forward and to question things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've made some people unhappy. 
<laughs> well, when I think of you, I think of one of the best read per people who really truly seek to understand not just to not just to get an opinion, but to truly understand world politics and world views. Is that what was given to you in the army? Is that what military intelligence looks like, or is that just your own innate curiosity? Well, I think a little bit of both. I mean, I've always been a fairly curious guy. I, you know willing to go just about anywhere to do virtually anything um, because if you don't you never you never know what's on the other side of the mountain mm -hmm. uh, but in my association with people in the military there are some tremendously bright and experienced people that you can learn things from and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's somebody who's in charge or who's reached a high rank or whatever but a lot of a lot of experiences are out there that people are willing to share with you, especially if you're you're in the uniform or you're you're in the the club, so to speak. They're willing to talk to you, and I've been around some just outstanding people. Like I was going to tell you that story about the the fellow that we knew down at Fort Huachuca. He was a um, an Air Force uh, pilot or a, a team member on a plane that got shot down over North Vietnam and it's it's the story of Bat 21 and we met this guy and uh, we invited him to have dinner with us one night and then we brought him into um, some of our classes the following day to talk about what it's like to be chased by the enemy and not get captured. And what did he say? Well, it was interesting. I, you could see the movie. There's a movie out, Bat 21. Um, it was uh, played by, um, oh, God, I can't remember the name. Gene Hackman. Okay. It's this guy. His yeah. name's uh, Hamilton. And they called him Ham. And he, was, he loved to golf. And the one thing that the pilot in the bird dog that was tracking him, he had a beeper and he knew where he was was that they were able to talk about all the golf links that he had been on. And he told them, he says, pretend that you're at Pebble Beach on, on uh, link number five, which is a south-facing uh, course that goes to, the, goes to the east 320 degrees. Uh, pretend you're on that and, and follow that. And so that's how they walked him out of the jungle as the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong were trying to concentrate and pick him up. And he finally got across the river into South Vietnam, and they were able to come in and pick him up. But they walked him through on all of the... But Danny Glover was the guy who was in the bird dog above him, helping him come out. But this guy, when you saw him, I mean, he, he could have sat right next to you over at Stella's and had a cup of coffee, and you'd never know that he was the guy who'd been chased by, by the enemy for 10 days in the jungles of North Vietnam. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things that I learned about the Vietnam stories is these people who I, some of whom I've known for years, have these amazing stories. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for your service and thank you for, uh, for fighting for uh, this country's freedoms because I've, I've always reminded people uh, we who practice journalism are protected by the First Amendment and it's a pretty <laughs> cool thing to, yeah. uh, to have that happen. So. James Mariska, thanks so much for the time today. Thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, you bet. This has been Daryl Ehrlich with James Mariska. Thanks so much for listening.